At the beginning, there was only chaos, night, dark Erebus, and deep Tartarus. Earth, the air, and heaven had no existence. Firstly, black wind night laid a germless egg in the bosom of the infinite deep of Erebus. And from this, after the revolution of long ages, sprang the graceful Eros with his glittering golden wings. Swift as the whirlwinds of the tempest, he mated in deep Tartarus with dark chaos, winged like himself, and thus hatched forth our race, which was the first to see the light. Eros is the god of love, lust, and sex. He is also known in Latin as Cupid, desire. According to Hesiod, he was the firstborn of the gods. Well, when most people think of Cupid or Eros, they think of a weak baby with an arrow, sidekick of Venus, an afterthought in the discussion of the gods. Nothing compared to Zeus, right? Well, not really. In fact, in one of the oldest novels passed down to us, known as Daphnis and Chloe by Longus, Daphnis and Chloe tells the story of a baby boy and a baby girl who are discovered separately, two years apart, alone and exposed on a Greek mountainside. Taken in by Goatherd and his shepherd and raised near the town of Mytilene, they grow to maturity hardly aware of one another's existence, until the mischievous god of love, Eros, creates in them a sudden overpowering desire for one another. One of the characters in the story, Philetus, says to the children, Daphne and Chloe, love, my children, is a god, young and beautiful and winged. That's why he delights in youth and pursues beauty and gives wings to the soul and he can do greater things than Zeus himself he has the power over the elements he has power over the stars he has power over his fellow gods far more than you have over your goats and your sheep the flowers are all love's handiwork these trees are his creations he is the reason why rivers run and winds blow. I've even known a bull that fell in love and used to bellow as if he'd been stung by a gadfly. And I've known a he-goat that loved a she-goat and followed her everywhere. I am going to argue that Eros is the mightiest of all the gods. But I'm not the only one who made this argument. In the masterpiece by Plato, known as Symposium, love, or eros, is the first topic of discussion at the wine party between Socrates and Phaedrus. Here is Phaedrus' speech in front of the people at the wine party with Socrates. Let Phaedrus begin the praise of love and good luck to him. All the company expressed their assent and desired him to do as Socrates bade him. Aristotemes did not recollect all that was said, nor do I recollect all that he related to me. But I will tell you what I thought was most worthy of remembrance and what the chief speaker said. Phaedrus began by affirming that love is a mighty God and wonderful among gods and men, but especially wonderful in his birth, for he is the eldest of the gods, which is an honor to him, and proof of his claim to his honor is that of his parents there is no memorial. Neither poet nor prose writer has ever affirmed that he had any. As Hesiod says, chaos came and then broad-brosomed earth 
the everlasting seat of all that is, and love. In other words, after chaos, the earth, and love, these two came into being. Also, Parmenides sings of generation. First, in the train of gods, he fashioned love. And Acusalius agrees with Hesiod. Thus numerous are the witness, who acknowledge love to be the eldest of the gods. And not only is he the eldest, he is the source of the greatest benefits to us. For I know not any greater blessing to a young man who is beginning life than a virtuous lover, or to the lover than a beloved youth. For the principle which ought to be the guide of men who would nobly live the principle, I say neither kindred, nor honor, nor wealth, nor any other motive is able to implant so well as love. Of what am I speaking? Of the sense of honor and dishonor, without which neither states or nor individuals ever do any good or great work. And I say that a lover who is detected in doing any dishonorable act or submitting through cowardice when any dishonor is done to him by another will be pained in being detected by his beloved than at being seen by his father or by his companions or by anyone else. The beloved, too, when he is found in any disgraceful situation, has the same feeling about his lover. And if there were only some way of contriving that a state or any army should be made up of lovers and their loves, they would be very best governors of their own city, abstaining from all dishonor and emulating one another in honor. And when fighting at each other's side, although a mere handful, they would overcome the world for what lover would not choose rather to be seen by all mankind than by his beloved. Either when abandoning his post or throwing away his arms, he would be ready to die a thousand deaths rather than endure this. Or who would desert his beloved or fail him in the hour of danger? The veriest coward would become an inspired hero, equal to the bravest at such a time. Love would inspire him. That courage which, as Homer says, the god breathes into the souls of the same heroes. Love of his own nature infuses into a lover. Love will make men dare to die for their beloved. Love alone, and women as well as men. Of this, Alcatraz, the daughter of Pelias, is a monument to all Hellas, for she was willing to lay down her life on behalf of her husband when no one else would. Although he had a father and a mother, but the tenderness of love so far exceeded theirs that she made them seem to be strangers in blood to their own son, and in name only related to him, and so noble did this action of hers appear to the gods as well as to other men. Among the many who have done virtuously, she is one of the very few to whom, in admiration of her noble action, they have granted the privilege of returning alive to earth. Such exceeding honor is paid by the gods to the devotion of virtue and love. Orpheus, the son of Augurus, the harper, they sent up empty away and presented to him an apparition only of her whom he sought, but herself they would not give up because he showed no spirit. He was only a harp player and did not dare like Alcasus to die for love, but was contriving how he might enter Hades alive. Moreover, they afterward caused him to suffer death at the hands of women as the punishment of his cowardliness. Very different was the reward of the true love of Achilles toward his lover Patroclus, his lover and not his love. The notion that Patroclus was the beloved one is a foolish error into which Aeschylus has fallen. For Achilles was surely the fairer of the two. Fairer also, all the other heroes, and as Homer informs us, he was still beardless and younger, and greatly as the gods honor the virtue of love. Still the return of love on the part of the beloved 
to the lover is more admired and valued and rewarded by them. For the lover is more divine because he is inspired by God. Now Achilles was quite aware, for he had been told by his mother that he might avoid death and return home to live to a good old age if he abstained from slaying Hector. Nevertheless, he gave his life to revenge his friend and dared to die, not only in his defense, but after he was dead. Wherever the gods honored him above Alcasus and sent him to the island of the blessed. These are my reasons for affirming that love is the eldest and noblest and mightiest of the gods and chiefest author and giver of virtue in life and of happiness after death. This or something like this was the speech of Phaedrus. As you can see, Plato lays it out pretty clearly. The god love, Eros, Cupid, is the motivating factor behind all that is good in the world. People who have aspirations, who seek to get things done, whether it's battles, whether it's building a, a society, the motivating factor behind it is usually love. It's usually the caring for the people that you're close to. It's usually keeping family safe or impressing a lover at a young age, protecting your children. We see this throughout ancient myths. Jason in the Argonautica is saved by Medea's grace. She, he is also anointed by Medea. But none of this would have happened have it not for Eros getting involved and in making Medea fall in love with Jason. Jason would have not have completed his journey. The same goes for Odysseus in the Odyssey. Would Odysseus be successful in his journey if it wasn't for Athena saving him time after time? And the reason behind it was Eros making Athena fall in love with Odysseus. So once again, love being the motivating factor, being the core, the driving factor behind the success in these epics. In the Dionysica, Eros drives Dionysus mad for Aura with delicious wound of his arrow. And the god roamed over the hills, scourged with the greatest fire. In the story of Eros and Psyche, which is within the golden ass of Apelius, the story tells a quest for love between Eros and Psyche. Aphrodite, jealous of the beauty of the mortal princess, Eros falls in love with Psyche and spirits her away to his home. After a visit from Psyche's jealous sisters, they cause Psyche to betray love. After wandering for a long time, Psyche runs into Aphrodite and asks for help and she gives him a series of difficult tasks. After successfully completing them, Aphrodite relents and Psyche becomes immortal to live alongside her husband Eros. The point of this is the motivating factor for love and Psyche, which is the incarnate god of the human soul, is the bond of love and marriage. The sort of glue that holds together all purpose in all things is love. Eros is not just famous in Greek mythology or Roman mythology as, as Cupid. Christianity has a lot to owe to Eros. Let me explain why. Mark 28 through 34. When one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. 
And well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. John 15, 9 through 17 states as follows, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you my friends. For everything I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. And in this verse in particular, he mentions that greater love has no other than this to lay down one's life for his friends. Similar to what we heard in Plato's Symposium, love being the motivating factor for people to do good deeds. Why this is the greatest commandment? Because other good deeds, other commandments become fulfilled just through this one commandment, which is why Eros is the firstborn in a pagan sense. Jesus was not the first Jew to come up with sayings like this. Hillel the Elder, a generation before Jesus, says that what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. The last thing I want to leave you with is from the Gnostic Nag Hammadi scriptures. It's a text known as On the Origin of the World. It's quite long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But there is a passage about Eros, and it says, Out of this first blood, Eros appeared, being androgynous. His masculine nature is humorous because he is fire from the light. His feminine nature is that of a soul of blood and is derived from the substance of forethought. He is very handsome in his beauty, having more loveliness than all the creatures of chaos. Then, when all the gods and their angels saw Eros, they became enamored of him. But when he appeared among all of them, he made them inflamed, just as many lamps are kindled from a single lamp, and the light shines, but the lamp is not diminished. So also Eros was scattered in all the creatures of chaos, but was not diminished, just as Eros appeared out of the midpoint between light and darkness, and in the midst of the angels and people the intercourse of Eros was consummated. So too. The first sensual pleasure sprouted upon the earth. The woman followed the earth, and marriage followed the woman, and reproduction followed marriage, and death followed reproduction. After Eros, the grapevine sprouted up from the blood that was shed upon the earth. Therefore those who drink the vine acquire the desire for intercourse. After the grapevine, a fig tree and a pomegranate tree sprouted up from the earth. Together the rest of the trees according to their kind their seed deriving from the seed of the authorities and their angels. This is a Gnostic version of the same thing that Hesiod and Phaedrus are getting at. It's also very relatable to what Jesus is getting at in his parables. If you do the commandment of love, everything else will follow. You don't need to worry about any other commandments because the commandment of love 
covers all the other commandments. Eros being the firstborn, that no other deity can come into existence without love because there is no purpose for them to be brought forth. But in this Gnostic text, the first blood was Eros appeared. And after Eros, the grapevine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, meaning in a Gnostic sense, instead of there being these gods, we have these different types of vines coming forth from the light of Gnosis. And Eros is the first one. If love is the only commandment you follow, all the other commandments will be fulfilled. All these things that we do, we fight, we build armies, we protect our cities, we protect our children, we protect our, our loved ones. We try to do things driven by love. All these characters and all these myths, Dionysus, Aphrodite, Medea, Athena, they are the saviors in all of these myths because they're driven by love, which is why love is the mightiest of all the gods.